<laughs> it's so nice to see you this morning and all of your warm and friendly faces and you had a beautiful day to drive down and visit campus and uh, we're excited to be here. We have a great program set up for today. I'm really excited um, to have you experience these speakers. Um, we're gonna get started right away this morning. Um, we have um, Karen V. Hansen. Karen is a professor at Brandeis University in Massachusetts. I had, uh, um, last spring I think it was, um, I had her book land on my desk and I picked it up and I literally just didn't put it down. I had it, I had it read within about 48 hours after getting it. Um, and it, a lot of it because I had family history that was, that was connected with the story that she was telling and the research that she'd done. So um, I was excited to see that she was going to be on the speaker's agenda for the Naha Norgay meeting um, this summer, which I also attended. And so she did just a wonderful talk there and I asked her if she would be interested in doing a presentation at this meeting and she graciously agreed to do so. So without further ado, I am going to um, have you welcome Karen Hansen. Uh, good morning. It is such a great pleasure to be here, and I just happen to have a copy of the book, so if anybody wants to see it. Um, I want to say that um, my journey of discovery in this uh, book actually began right here in the Naha archives. Um, and I just want to thank all of you for sustaining that wonderful resource and the tradition that it represents. My story begins in the early 20th century in a particular place, the Spirit Lake Dakota Indian Reservation in North Dakota. When I was a child, my Norwegian grandmother told me an unlikely story about growing up on an Indian reservation. I knew from my study of history that women had homesteaded land in the West, but Scandinavians on an Indian reservation? Hard to fathom, um, the story stayed with me. My grandmother explicitly said, we stole the land from the Indians. As I drove out to the Spirit Lake Reservation for the first time, I was filled with trepidation. I'd never been on an Indian reservation before, and I was struck by the beauty of the prairies and the astonishing bird life coursing down the North American flyway. But nothing was familiar, and I knew no one. A gravel road that headed to the Cheyenne River marked the border of my great-grandmother's homestead, and I could see her shack perched atop the gentle hill. After talking to local history keepers, I discovered that my grandmother had not been the only Norwegian living there, nor was she the only woman homesteader. The curious juxtaposition of Scandinavian homesteaders with Dakota Indians intrigued me and launched me on a 15-year journey to explore how it happened and with what consequences. The project turned into an unwieldy community study full of racial ethnic tensions and a series of unfolding surprises. Some surfaced only after the book was published. More on that later. In an oral history recorded for the State Historical Society of North Dakota, Second-generation Norwegian-American Garina Mo told of her husband's rare and valuable talent. He was a water dowser. Quote, he could go out with the willow and wherever there was water, the willow turned down to the ground. Now, many on the prairie are called upon to find and tap that scarce essential resource. Water was harder to find in some places, and farmers could dig as many as, many as 20 wells before they found it. In other places, such as the Moe's Farm, they were lucky enough to find water with the first dig and have the well last for over 50 years. Now, one of the delightful people that I met in North Dakota is a different kind of dowser. Second-generation Norwegian-American Yule Smestad is a bone dowser. Instead of locating water with a willow branch, he has the gift of finding bones. In locating people's skeletal remains, he links the living to the dead by allowing them to know precisely where their ancestors lay. 
In the process of identifying these unmarked graves, Smestad unearths the consequences of judgment, superstition, and prejudice. Some wayward souls were buried outside consecrated ground because the church fathers found their lives unworthy of holy sanction or forgiveness. Others were excluded because they were the wrong religion or nationality. Yule Smestad once located an African-American family buried on the periphery of a church cemetery. He said, sure enough, see, I found one just outside the fence. See, they wouldn't let him in. Like Yule Smestad, I feel the calling of a dowser, a story dowser. I search for the forgotten or vexing stories of the past, bringing some unrecognized members into the family plot and marking their graves. But I do not always put people at ease by knowing that their ancestors are rightfully placed. Unlike Yul Smestad, I do not leave the bones where they lay. I dig them up, reassemble them, based on my best guess of how they fit together, and hope that in doing so, I will bring all of us closer to understanding the meanings and consequences of actions long ago. On the reservation, Dakota's visits to settlers' homes often had an element of surprise. Not only were they unscheduled, but Indians did not knock. Early white settlers told many stories of being startled by the unaccustomed presence of an Indian in their house. They would hear nothing, feel their skin prickle, and then notice someone standing behind them or in the next room. In an oral history, Grace Lambert a Dakota elder, explained the cultural practices behind many a misunderstanding. Dakotas, as she put it, never lived in houses, so they had no custom of knocking on doors. She said, I remember when we were kids, when we would go anywhere, we never knocked on doors. They just opened the door and walk in because a teepee has no door, and so you couldn't be standing there knocking on a teepee. And then she laughs. <laughs> they just open the flap and walk in. So we did the same. We opened the door and walked in. <laughs> when I think of it now, I think, my, we were rude. And then she burst out laughing. <laughs> Grace Lambert made an effort to understand the logic of white people who lived on the reservation, just as she strove to learn, interpret, and convey her own people's history and practices. Accustomed to teepees, Dakotas did not knock. With wooden dwellings, Scandinavians did. They understood their homes as private property and as places of familial sanctuary. Dakotas considered their teepees to be open to family and guests, a place to rest and a place to host. Honorary tribal historian of Spirit Lake Dakotas, Louis, Louis, Louis Garcia, I always call him Louis, uh, recalls a knocking story. He said that Solomon Red Fox, and Solomon Red Fox is this gentleman in the overalls right here. Um, Solomon Red Fox was a great joker. He'd come into the white farmer's house, come in the door, shut the door behind him, and then he'd knock on the door. <laughs> in story after story, encounters between Dakota Indians and Scandinavian settlers began with apprehension, involved an exchange, and ended with gestures of friendliness that dissipated hostility and misunderstanding. Another account relayed to me by Garcia explains the backstory to this photograph of Solomon Red Fox and his family. The US government turned to religious institutions in the 1870s to administer Indian policy through educating and Christianizing Native people. At Spirit Lake, this translated into missions by Episcopalians and Catholics. Religious observance continued to reinforce cultural divides between Scandinavian Lutherans and Dakota Presbyterians and Catholics. At times, religious affiliation seemed actually less important than the practice of Christianity. In the summer of 1929, when this photograph was taken, while in transit between Fort Totten and Lake Traverse Sisseton Reservation, the Red Fox family was visiting kin and picking berries. They camped at the dump grounds here near Binford, North Dakota, where they would sometimes stay and rummage for salvageable items. 
After setting up camp, Mrs. Louise Red, Bear, um, Red Fox Two Bear gave birth to a child. You can see her, let's see, uh, sitting here with a baby in the front. Now, as Christians, the family valued the spiritual importance of baptizing the newborn baby. Given the high incidence of infant mortality among Dakotas, they urgently sought assistance. So the following morning, they successfully conscripted Reverend Matthias Ordahl, a Lutheran minister, and you can see him standing there, his coat and uh, hat on the, on the lean-to there. Um, he was a Lutheran minister, and they conscripted him to come out and to baptize the baby. Although the Red Fox family was not Lutheran, they warmly received Reverend Ordahl with his daughter in tow. So that's his daughter in the front. In an encounter, expectations are interrupted and undermined, prompting, prompting people to try to understand each other's motivations and intentions. Dislocated people um, try to understand uh, the, the, the cultural insider's perspective and bring their own history um, to a very strange place. And in turn, they're seen as outsiders, people without a history. Now, to the reigning, better established, English-speaking Yankees, Scandinavian newcomers did not have a history, except insofar as they were land-hungry peasants. Describing the influx of immigrants as an overwhelming act of nature, Cherry Lane Wood, born to a Yankee family in Dakota Territory, commented, there's an awful lot of Scandinavians in through here, but when we was first here, when I was little, there wasn't any. They came in just like a flood. From the perspective of Dakotas, Scandinavians were yet another group of white people trying to seize their land. In turn, Yankees and Scandinavians did not recognize that Native people had a long record of adaptation, innovation, and change. Rather, they cast Dakotas as fierce warriors, men, not women, who were remnants of the past, not people who belonged to modern society. The white groups paid little attention to women, even at even though it was they who were farmers in Dakota culture and respected by Dakota men for the many contributions they made. Power enables one group to um, assert the invisibility of a subordinate group, erase its history, and to, uh, and to disrespect its distinctiveness. But underlying cultural misunderstandings was the conflict over land. On the Spirit Lake Dakota Indian Reservation, we confront the human face of expor expropriation, the land takers and the dispossessed. The encounter was imbued with a mutual fearfulness born of violent conflict. The U.S.-Dakota War of 1862, which occurred in Minnesota and you probably all know a lot about, um, happened far from the reservation, but it, affected, it directly affected many of those who came to live there. Sisseton's and Wapitans at Spirit Lake had lived in southern Minnesota prior to the war, as had some of the Norwegians who then relocated to North Dakota. So although Dakotas lost the War of 1862, they killed a large number of white settlers and government soldiers. And in turn, hundreds of Dakotas were killed. Reeling from their loss of their historic way of life in the wake of the war, but still recognized as a sovereign nation, Sisseton, Wapiton, and He Hungtonwana bands of Dakotas collectively negotiated a treaty with the US government in 1867 that established this 240,000 acre reservation. Dispossession for them meant relocation and population decline. All across the Great Plains, Whites were frightened by the military prowess of Indians. With attitudes shaped by newspaper accounts, family stories, novels, and their own imagination, Scandinavians entered the region with an encounter anxiety and expectations of conflict. Second generation Swedish uh, American Gust Berg bought land on the reservation in 1922 after he married Annie Bostrom, who had just arrived from Sweden. 
Gust's father and older brother had homesteaded. He recalled, I was scared to death of them Indians because they said they'd scout people, see, and they made me believe that, and I was scared to death. And then the Indians came over one day by the name of Fox. So in effect, visiting with Solomon Red Fox, the gentleman we saw on an earlier slide, um, Gust was no longer afraid. Now in turn, white settlers, including Scandinavians, inspired dread as well as unease in Indians. Dakotas had good reason to fear the US Army. It had a reputation for fighting unfairly, massacring women and children, and vengefully destroying homes and stockpiles of food. And settlers came for land, their land. The immigrant Norwegian Knudsen family had multiple tenant-landlord relationships over the years. One of the children, Bjorn Knudsen, a self-described full-blooded Norwegian, uh, born and raised on the reservation, was 12 when his father sent him to plow a field that they were renting from the recently widowed Mary Blackshield. She was one of a handful of Indian women who made efforts to expand their land holdings. When, as they called it, dead Indian land was put on the market, she made bids to purchase more. She successfully used her land to generate an income to support herself and her elderly mother. Because it was far from his house, Bjorn had to spend the week at the home of Mrs. Blackshield, whom he had never met before. So I'm gonna quote Bjorn at length. Dad rigged up a set of full, full line of equipment, horses and plow and a wagon and everything, and he told me just exactly where to go. When I pull into the yard at Mrs. Blackshield's, there was an elderly Indian lady outside plastering her chicken coop with mud. She had mud from her face clear down to her knees. And then he's laughing. But it was kind of a yellow clay, and that was what the Indian people used if they could find that kind of soil to plaster their buildings with, their log buildings. She knew I was coming. She says, put your horses in the barn, she said. I know you're supposed to stay here, and I know your dad real well. And she says, there's feed in the bin. She says, there's hay in the upstairs. Take care of your horses, she says, and come in and supper will be ready. Well, I wasn't too enthused. At that particular time, I wasn't really hungry. And he started laughing because it just made me wonder what kind of household would this be where I had to stay? But when I stepped into that home, I got the biggest surprise of my life. That lady was all washed up. She had a nice clean dress on. Everything was spick and span. There was a tablecloth on the table. She lived in a two-room house, but it had an upstairs, and it had a plain floor, not pine, but a fir floor, and that floor had been scrubbed so it was almost white. It was one of the best, as good a meal as I've ever eaten. I stayed there about a week. Now, young Bjorn knew that women working on farms got dirty. His own mother was a prime example. But he did not know Mrs. Blackshield, and he was put off by her initial appearance. Now, in retrospect, he was amused by his fear of the unknown. Mrs. Blackshield was a well-educated lady, he laughed. She had taken many prizes in cooking and baking and exhibiting products like that at the fairs in the county. Of course, I didn't know this. I thought she was just like some other Indian neighbor we had, just common people. But she was a well-educated Indian lady. So he reckoned that he had the nerve to enter the house, quote, because I knew that dad would never send me to a place that wasn't fit to live in. While Mrs. Blackshield did her best to make Bjorn feel at home that week, he continued to be intimidated by her mother, who lived with her. Education diminished the distance between Dakotas and Scandinavians, but there remained a huge gulf of understanding when facial expressions, customs, and cultural markers could not be interpreted or could easily be misinterpreted. I have to say this about her mother. Her mother did not like me. She could not speak English, but she would sit and stare at me, so I was almost afraid of her, because I could understand why the Indian people didn't care much about the white people in those days. I imagine that was the reason for it. The young Bjorn, who did not speak Dakota, and Mrs. Blackshield's mother, who did not speak English or Norwegian, experienced a cultural standoff. 
From Bjorn's perspective, an elderly lady sitting quietly in the corner would make no gesture of friendship only if she were angry. His cultural estrangement was mediated through a lens tinged by guilt. He inferred her motives for not liking him. They still say it today that the white man came into this country and took their land away from them, and they weren't properly reimbursed for it. Bjorn Knudsen knew that Dakotas got a raw deal, yet his family lived right there on the reservation. His father was employed at the Fort Totten boarding school teaching carpentry to Indian children. His mother ran the farm that they homesteaded. In effect, their livelihoods were dependent on the dispossession of Dakotas and the government efforts to assimilate them through schooling. Bjorn was aware of all of that, so he interpreted the ancient mother's steady gaze as disapproval and dislike. That lady was at least 100 years old. She'd sit in a chair and she'd mumble to herself all the time. Now whether she was talking Indian, I don't know. She was really an old lady and she sat in that one particular place. But I could tell by looking at her that she didn't like me. Uh-uh, no. Now we have to ask what might this situation have looked like from the perspective of Mrs. Blackshield's mother? In her culture, young people were expected to defer to elders. She may or may not have liked him personally. Certainly, she knew that the, the horrors white people had perpetrated on Indians, although we do not know her specific story. The intimate encounter would have compelled her to exercise careful discernment about this young Norwegian boy entering her daughter's house and plowing her land. The government structured the conditions of the land taking on the reservation through two pieces of legislation in particular, the Dawes Act of 1887 and the Land Allotment Act of 1904. In a nutshell, after allotment of private property to individual Indians, the Spirit Lake Reservation was open to white homesteading. This broadside, uh, published in 1904, marked in red those parcels on the reservation, the unallotted land, that were open to white homesteading. And just to help you orient, the, the squiggly line to the north marks the border of Devil's Lake, and the squiggly line at the bottom is the Cheyenne River, which served as the southern border to the reservation. So in effect, uh, this legislation created the, the seeds of coexistence as well as the seeds of further dispossession. Because as you can see, even though there are swaths of red, it's a mosaic. Here, Scandinavians became settler colonists. They arrived as part of migration streams and they searched for a place to make home. They came to anchor themselves on the land, making farms and families while they did not venture forth as mercenaries or as conscious participants in a colonial scheme, they nonetheless advanced the US imperial project of seizing and transforming North America. Internationally and locally, settler colonialism was grounded upon what Patrick Wolfe calls the elimination of the native logic. I love plat maps of the Midwest. That's one of the things that's kept drawing me back. I just think they're utterly fascinating. So in this close-up of the, the, a plat map of Eddy Township in 1910, um, you can see the distinctive situation at Spirit Lake and how it integrated immigrant settlers and native peoples. So um, again, that squiggly line is the Cheyenne River. And, you know, again, just meditate on some of the names, but this uh, unmarked section uh, here, south, southwest section of number 13 is actually where my great-grandmother homesteaded. So she was just right there near the Cheyenne River. So interestingly, integration of white people and Dakota people was part of the intention of the legislation. So white homesteaders were supposed to live on the reservation amongst Dakotas. And you can see here that they, in fact, did. Now, when Scandinavians moved onto the reservation in 1904, Dakotas were demographically dominant. But by 1910, non-Indians outnumbered enrolled tribal members on the reservation. 
So as indigenous people, Dakotas were marginalized by a culture that sought to diminish them, eliminate, absorb, and or exoticize them. And a racial lens made them perpetual strangers. And as you can see, um, they also then lived in an integrated community, which they had not been used to um, prior. By 1910, so six years after the reservation was open to white homesteaders, as a group, Scandinavians were large landowners on the reservation, second only to Dakotas. But over the next 20 years, Dakotas' land loss accelerated, Dakotas owned less acreage, and fewer Dakotas owned land. So you can see Dakotas are in, um, over here on the left, and uh, the blue is 1910, uh, the, the yellow is 1929, and uh, you can see the, the dramatic drop-off for Dakotas, and you can see the increase for Scandinavians. So in effect, um, by 1929, Scandinavians were the largest landowners on the reservation. Now I wanna be perfectly clear that the successful Scandinavian landowners were still among the poorest farmers in the state. In 1930, their average farm size was one third the size of North Dakota as a whole. And as farmers soon realized, a quarter section, 160 acres, uh, which was the size of a homestead or an allotment parcel, um, was too small to allow dry land farmer to grow enough wheat to support a family. Neither adversaries nor allies, both Scandinavians and Dakotas, were displaced and both were profoundly poor. So the strong arm of the government intervened in, monitored, and undermined Dakota's lives while it permitted Scandinavians to navigate their own adaptations as long as, and I say this um, with uh, some emphasis because I don't think this could be taken for granted, as long as they sent their children to school, paid taxes, and learned to speak English. And I assure you I have plenty of evidence of them resisting each of those things at various moments in the early days. So in that context, it's a surprise to find similarities uh, that uh, Scandinavians shared with Dakotas. They were trying to make a living through farming in very harsh environment. They were both dirt poor and had little capital. Uh, they both made efforts to maintain their language in the face of English-only campaigns by, by the state and by the nation and they valued and maintained kinship ties. Spirit Lake was a place of defiant persistence, regardless of ancestry or culture. Neither group followed the road to assimilation planned by government officials and reformers. Jointly and separately, Dakotas and Scandinavians found ways to subvert Americanization efforts that targeted them. Yet, homesteaders gained their foothold as landowners and as citizens through Dakota's dispossession. So this process placed the two groups in antagonistic positions, even as um, both were struggling to make new lives in a demanding political and economic environment. So legal distinctions racialized and subordinated native people and kept them separate to a certain extent. But ironically, the reservation held them in close proximity to Scandinavians. So they were poor, marginalized, non-English speaking people who lived side by side. Now, living close together also drove a wedge between Dakotas and Scandinavians. Second generation Norwegian, Einar Severson recalled a visit by an Indian family to his childhood homestead in Nelson County on the Totten Trail, not far from Spirit Lake, but not on the reservation. Now, Native people frequently traveled across their property, or from a different perspective, their farm fell on the long-used Indian byway. Love this picture of Einar. Such an amazing face. Einar recalled a moment in his childhood that powerfully delineated a racial-ethnic boundary observed by his father. 
I remember there was one time there was an Indian family come in a covered wagon and they stopped at our place and they had a baby born and he died. He died right there on the homestead and they stopped overnight. They asked him if they could bury him anywhere out there on the land. Well, no, dad said. You can, uh, we'd rather have you bury him off my property and bury it right down on that road that comes in right where Route 32 comes into town here. So they buried him right, right by the road. I imagine we, it went up in bones when they built the road the second time. It's very painful to imagine how the Indian parents must have felt. They lost their baby while in transit and their request to bury him where he died was denied. Now, Einer's father's proprietary sense about his property converged with his aversion to Indians and his possible concern that their repeated returns to pay tribute to their departed child would be an issue for him. Would he have done the same to another Norwegian family passing through? Now, without embalming, a dead body would quickly decay. So for health reasons and presumably emotional ones as well, immediate interment was required. So the family had to bury their infant near the road. In retrospect, at the age of 84, Einar Severson struggled with the cruelty of his father's act. As I was finishing my book and about to go to press, I sent a copy of it to the honorary tribal historian, Louis Garcia, who I mentioned earlier. I had consulted him regularly about the ancestral logic of Dakota practices and the spelling of Dakota names. So he read this part of the manuscript and he said, oh, he'd heard that same story from someone else. So about 20 years before, uh, the former tribal chairman of Spirit Lake Dakotas, a man named Elmer White, had told Garcia that members of the tribe had gone out in the region looking for evidence of Dakota history. And they would stop at farms and, and talk to people and see what they knew and what they had found. So in the process, Elmer White had stopped by the Severson farm and uh, the family told him this same story. So he told Garcia that to this day, the grave is guarded. When road improvements have been made, they oversee the process to make sure the grave is not disturbed. I was very moved by this and of course, I interpreted Luis Garcia's comments in light of what I knew about racial ethnic po politics in the region. The clash of perspectives between Dakota people and Scandinavian immigrants on the meaning of private property explained part of this tragic confrontation. The law stood on the side of the Norwegian homesteaders. So I concluded that the Dakota family whose baby died tended the grave. So I include this very poignant point in my book. So with the book freshly in print just a year ago, um, I sent a copy to Louis and he sent me this email saying, Karen, you got it wrong. Whoops, page 56, no, no. Um, he said, it was not the Dakota family that guarded the grave, but the Severson family. The Norwegian landowners continued to tend the infant's grave. So Garcia elaborated on this. He said, when they widened the road, grandpa stood on the grave and made the machinery go around him as he didn't want the grave disturbed. It was his mission in life. Seriously troubled by his father's behavior, Einar Severson told an interviewer from the State Historical Society this story 70 or more years after it happened. Why did he not say that his family had made amends to, um, to honor the dead baby and to tend the grave? Was it a son's a attempt to blame his father for an unforgivable action? Now, unfortunately, Einar Severson died some years ago, as did Elmer White. But I think this uh, sends a clear message, which you all know already. History is alive and it's controversial. So while I'm very troubled by my error of interpretation, um, I was also newly optimistic about the possibilities inferred by the new meaning of the story. 
it no longer conveyed an intractable divide between Scandinavians and Dakotas. In this instance, a family recognized its profound misjudgment and sought to make amends for its actions. So last November, after the book was out, uh, I went to Little Hoop Community College, which is on the Spirit Lake Reservation, and uh, talked about my findings. Um, I told the audience of my exchange with Louis Garcia, who was in the audience at the, at the moment, and the discovery that I made after the book. And I invited people in the audience to send me any family stories they might have had that would shed more light on what precisely it had happened and who was the, the tender of the grave. Um, a Dakota man in the audience raised his hand and said, I don't need you to do any more research. He said that the basic fact that this story had been inverted now gave him pause and a lot to think about in terms of relationships between Norwegians and Dakotas in the area. Fine, that's good for me. That's, that's gonna take me a long way. In undertaking this project, I sought to grasp how Scandinavians reconciled their vision of themselves as a fair and ethical people with their role in the land taking. And I have discovered how deeply complicated this story is. The reservation context required tolerance as clashes of logics had to be negotiated. And everyone had to reckon, not just with the historic, but the continued dispossession of Dakota people. The Dakota man's account was a powerful example to me of how understanding the past can help create a path to reconciliation today. To close, I want to pass along something that Grace Lambert told me as she recalled one of the great Dakota chiefs, Sitting Bull. He told his grandchildren, he says, my grandchildren, the white people are here to teach you, he says, but listen and look. Whatever's good, pick it up. Whatever is no good, don't. And I think he was right. Now, ironies abound at every turn. You can't make this stuff up. I, I think I would be more challenged as a novelist than as a social scientist. Um, but expectations do not follow one dominant logic. On the reservation for Scandinavians and other white settlers, for example, and it's here in this photograph, Independence Day meant Indian dancing. Dakotas shaped celebration of the nation. Central to every 4th of July were Indian dancers. And Norwegians turned out in droves, as did other people. You asked them about Thanksgiving, could not understand the story of Thanksgiving, didn't celebrate it, thought it was an odd holiday. But the birth of the nation, they were there. And at the centerpiece was um, Indian dancers. Um, and I wanna show an, another slide um, from the reservation in light of the 2014 Winter Olympics. <laughs> Norwegians profoundly influenced life on the reservation because they built a ski jet on one of the hills on the reservation uh, in the early 30s. So I want to thank you and I want to say that I extend my book as an offering to the storytellers who have worked with me and to their descendants, and to all of you who are similarly troubled or intrigued and want to learn more about this tangled past. Thank you very much. I think we should take questions. I did want to mention the um, the bookstore does have copies, um, and they are open until four this afternoon. So if you are um, like me, excited about um, the book and and being able to get your hands on it, it's available. But I'm ha happy to answer questions. First question: Just is is what was Spirit Lake or what was Dakota? Is, it, is Devil's Lake and Spirit Lake the same? You probably said that. Um, I actually didn't say it explicitly, and I apologize for that, but thank you for clarifying. Yes, so um, when white settlers first came to the area, they interpreted Maniwakan to mean Devil's Lake. They, you know, they had that particular frame. 
So, um, and so it was called the Devil's Lake Sioux Indian Reservation until the 1990s when the tribe had the, the, it's a, the, the reservation's original meaning returned. So it's now the Spirit Lake Dakota Reservation. So. And then one other quick question. Um, you know when you showed that, I love flat whips. Oh good, do you want me? I didn't, see, I didn't see Indian names there unless I just didn't know which were the Indian names. Okay, um, so let me point out a few. Um, they're, they're Dakota, here's Wasan. Here are a couple of long Dakota names that I have trouble pronouncing. Okay. Um, but there's, um, let's see, there's a lot, lot of Norwegian names. Um, there's Indian land right there. Hugh, Hugh Peoples uh, was uh, Dakota. Um, let's see. So down below right there. there. Yeah. There. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. The writing's small. Yes. If you were um, to look at a flat map today, who would the owners be today? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, and it would be a huge project. I don't even want to tell you how many years it took me to construct, to, to code all of these maps and to construct the database that allowed me to plot the land loss over time or land gain. Um, uh, Norwegians and other Scandinavian groups, but Norwegians were the biggest group on the reservation, still owned land and still farm it and still live there. Um, I would say individ individual in Dakota landowners are, are fewer in number, um, but the tribe owns a lot of land, which wasn't true at this point in time. So the Indian Reorganization Act of eight, 1934 enabled the tribe to buy land. And now when land comes on the open market, they get right of first refusal. So, but I can't tell you um, the numbers. Um, or, and I haven't seen a recent plot map, but maybe somebody here has. Yes? You, talk, you described this as being a 15 year process. It's probably a little bit more longer than that, but can you summarize a little bit more about your, the 15 years and what you did and how you got to, to doing what you're doing? Um, sure. Um, I'll try to give a short version of that. <laughs> um, uh, the question was about my process, and um, and this very nice woman did not say, "Why did it take you so long?" She said, "You know, what what was the journey like? What what were the different parts of it?" Um, well, the first visit I made was to the reservation, um, and and uh, a local history keeper helped me find that plat. Um, of where my great-grandmother had homesteaded. And I was so struck by how beautiful it was. And, and all the Norwegians around it, just, I thought it was just an oddity. And it, in fact, wasn't. It was a social process. Um, so I went back and decided I had to approach this in a scholarly way. And I really needed to write about it. And so again, my first visit what, then when I came back was to the Naha archives. Um, and what I quickly learned was sources are extremely hard to find. This is post, you know, know, a post turn of the 20th century. So when you look in the Norwegian archives, which I've also tried to do, there just aren't that many letters that have been deposited from such a recent period. So I, I was used to working with letters and diaries and really could not find any, except a few published collections. Um, and what I found in regional archives is that there might be um, things relevant to families in Minnesota, even families in North Dakota, but not specific to the reservation. So I, I had to get local and close. And the plat maps were so good at rooting me uh, in that place. So I, um, I got help from undergraduate and graduate students to code all these names, look them up on the 1910 census to, dis to figure out if, uh, if they were male or female, and uh, where, where they were born, where their parents were born. And, um, and you notice that I use the term Scandinavian instead of Norwegian much of the time, and, that, and I do that advisedly because you know, the Carlsons on here are both Norwegian and Swedish, and it's uh, virtually impossible to tell them apart. So um, Norwegians were the biggest group, but there were, there were lots of Swedes too. Um, so I worked with the land, um, the, the land records, I, I, um, this was the early infancy of geographic information systems. I don't know if any of you work with those. Uh, it's a very sophisticated, amazing mapping program.
program. And, um, and I knew that it wasn't really worth my time to learn how to use it, but I had to find somebody who knew how to use it that, was, that would help me. And that actually took probably about four or five years to even r find the right person. And I was uh, hanging out in the um, map room at Harvard Library, and uh, I found this great graduate student from the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> and so um, anyway, he helped me because I have arrays of land ownership as well as the charts. So he helped me. But so that was another sideline. And, and I realized that because there were so few letters and diaries, um, either they were in people's um, basements or they didn't exist, um, but that I needed to use oral histories. And oral histories had their own set of issues um, of reflection, what's remembered, all, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with all of this. So um, I did set out and did about 35 of my own, um, including with members of my own family, but um, I also used a, a huge collection at the State Historical Society of North Dakota, which pro proved really invaluable when I located people in the four county region. Again, it had to be specific to that area in order for them to talk about native people. They just, otherwise native people are invisible um, in their accounts. So I've used those and the um, American Indian Research Project in South Dakota also had some early oral histories but, uh, that I was able to, um, to use as well. And so, um, I just was constantly looking for things, newspapers, you know, episodic, random, what does this mean, who really wrote this, uh, you know, there were all these questions of where does this come from, whose voice is it, what's the evidence, and so there was always that struggle as I kept going, there's got to be more, there's got to be more, um, and at a certain point I said, you know, I, I've just, I've got to write this book. And there are just going to be holes because that's how the history is. But I would also just say that another struggle with the sources and with the writing is being a descendant of one of those Norwegian homesteaders. So um, uh, my great grandmother benefited from this, um, this process of dispossession as well. And she was a poor farmer. and. Um, you know, but she had a place to live. She survived. Um, my grandmother grew up there. You know, moved to Saskatchewan in 1910. Um, so my family history evolved, but I still had some responsibility um, in the history I I felt, and um, and so I've been very careful to try to be. Empathetic with Dakota's point of view, especially when they would be willing to talk to me, which some were um, and some weren't, and to try to understand what this was like from their perspective. But knowing that with a name like Karen Hansen, you can't disguise your Scandinavian heritage, and you know that that was the dominant perspective of the book. So that's been a balancing act for the whole time as well. Yeah, Lou. Did you get a chance to uh, uh, go into the whole subject of intermarriage between the Scandinavians and the Indians? That's a really good question, and the short answer is no. Um, and the short answer is there were very few marriages um, in this period leading up to 1930 that I studied. Formal marriages, you know. Now, some people have speculated about some of those Norwegian bachelor farmers and whether they really had, you know, um, domestic partners who were Dakota. I and I and I have a great uncle who I have some ideas about in that regard. Um, I found really only two uh, legal marriages in this period. Uh, one was a recent Norwegian immigrant woman who married uh, one, a high-status Dakota man on the reservation in. 1915, I believe it was. And there was also a Dakota woman who married, I think, a second generation Norwegian man. And, um, and that was about it. But in, in terms of what it was like and, and, uh, and how people treated them, really hard to tell, except that they, their marriages were noted, if you, if you were. People would give their full names that had Dakota and Norwegian in them. Um, so, and I have two theories about this. One is that um, 
that Scandinavians, uh, Norwegians especially, had their own churches. They, they shared them with the Swedes uh, sometimes, but um, they, uh, they, they were, you know, they, they were speaking their own language, they were observing their own religious religion, and they weren't that interested in evangelizing people across the street. They, they, just, they were just, okay, I, I wanna practice my culture and my religion, leave me alone, I, and I'm happy. Um, so, and Dakotas felt the same. It was like, you know, okay, they're fine, we'll sell things to these people, but you know, we don't need to be intermingled. So I think there, that, that separateness made a difference. And Dakotas were primarily Catholic and Presbyterian. Um, Catholic, even though I mentioned there was an Episcopalian um, mission on, on the reservation as well, but it was very small. So the Catholic Church was the, the bigger mission and school, and then um, the Dakota Presbytery was very, um, a Presbyterian church was a very powerful because it had lay Dakota preachers. And uh, the Pond brothers had actually translated the Bible into Dakota in the 1850s. So yeah, so there was a, a tradition. So there, the religions were separate. Um, the languages were separate except in trade and in work. And, and people did come together, especially in harvest, uh, to help each other. Um, and, and then the other thing that I think is interesting and uh, speaks to more intermarriage, which does happen later, I would say, especially after World War II. Um, but once uh, white settlers were living on the reservation, uh, the county established public schools because white settlers had to pay taxes to the county and the state and Dakota people did not. So Dakota schools up until that time had been paid by the US government and they were in, you know, they, they outsourced to um, you know, Catholic nuns and things like that, but, so, but it came from the federal government. So once there were white settlers on the reservation, there started being these public day schools. Well, once there was a public day school, you know, in your corner of the reservation, many, many Dakota parents would say, I want my kid to go here. I'm not going to send him to the boarding school, you know, 30 miles away that I, and I can't see him in the middle of winter. So, um, so the schools started being integrated very quickly. So the first school that I could find was established in 1907. And, you know, they, uh, the white settlers just started in, in 1904. So, those children tended to grow up together. And uh, so I have some accounts from people who attended those integrated day schools and, and, and had friendships across racial group. And I think those led to a different kind of understanding later on. So that's part of how I explain the, the more intermarriage later on. Yes? Uh, when those schools were started, was that when English started to be taught? So that they would then they would be in, a, in an environment where the, the that language became English rather than. Um, yes, I mean, English had been taught at the boarding school and at the, the, the sister school they called the, the Catholic nun school. So, um, and they had actually, in regard to the Dakota children, um, teachers had been very strict because, you know, interrupting the language and cultural transmission was part of their mission. Um, but obviously the Americanization efforts with immigrants was really important too. So um, it was, but I'll, I'll tell you that that from the stories that I've heard, um, it depended on who your teacher were, was and how tolerant she was, and they were mostly women. Um, so, and some of them were um, Norwegian and Swedish themselves. And so, you know, I have accounts of people saying, yeah, oh, you know, we only spoke Norwegian at home, and then when I got to school, our teacher didn't really mind. And there were other people who got disciplined, um, so they'd go across the street to be able to speak Norwegian or something like that. But, but what I did see and that I found interesting, and again, this may be the product of this time and place because it's very remote and these are very poor people who are immigrating later than you know uh, folks in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, there was a real hostility by, on the part of many of them to learning English also. So it wasn't something that they necessarily embraced. Um, they privileged uh, their, their mother tongue and um, sent their children to Sunday schools, um, and then they would talk about the English school. 
Um, so, and you know, and many people who had been interviewed by the State Historical Society, and this was done in the 1970s, um, only went to the fourth grade. So, you know, they did their schooling and then they had to work on the farm. So, um, you know, you don't acquire that much English in those four years and then you go home and you speak Norwegian and, you know, so it, it doesn't have that much currency. Yes, Norwegian and Swedish, sometimes they would trade off. But yeah, up until, um, there's a really nice study of language use in churches, and um, uh, it shows that really up until the 30s, Norwegian was the primary um, language in the churches in, in North Dakota. Yeah. Yes. Uh, many of us here in Minnesota have read the novels of Louise Ehrlich. Uh -huh. How do her stories resonate with your stories, uh, if you've read her? Um, I have read her no novels, and I'm a great um, admirer of her work. She's from the Turtle Mountain Chippewa, Band of Chippewa Reservation, which is actually just north of Devil's Lake. And, um, and it's a very small reservation. It's only a couple of sections, uh, townships. Um, so it's very small. So what that meant... Um, is that many uh, Turtle Mountain Chippewa children were sent to school at Spirit Lake. Um, and there is an historic rivalry between Dakotas and Chippewa. So that didn't go so well, actually. Um, or at least the, the s stories that I did get were about tensions and, um, and Dakota families feeling that the Chippewa children were privileged by the, the school authorities and things like that. Um, again, I haven't ever tried to adju adjudicate any of those. I just recognize that it was a tension that the children had to live with and that the parents had to live with. So, um, you know, her novels, I think, I think don't speak directly, I mean, I, I can't speak to the contemporary experience because I really haven't studied it. There is a casino on Spirit Lake Reservation today, and uh, the casino's been uh, successful. It's a dry casino. Um, there's also a resort there because the fishing's supposed to be really good in Devil's Lake. Um, but yeah, I can't really speak to the other parts of it. Yeah. Yes? Is Devil's Lake to the north of this talk show? Um, yes, so let me just back up a little you bit. Had it there for a little yeah. Short, so. so that section that I showed you is right in here. Okay. okay. And so here's the Shine River, and there's the lake, uh, which is still called Devil's Lake on any map today. Um, and you can see it says Devil's Lake Indian Reservation. So this is from 1904. So but, what are the red again? So, are those the Indian lands? No, the, the red land is the land that becomes available to white settlers. Yeah. It's the unallotted land. And, you know, if any of you have ever been out to this part of North Dakota, you know that the, the northern part of the reservation is actually a little bit hilly. It's the end of a glacial moraine. And um, so it's more wooded around the lake and hilly. So if you're a farmer, you want to live south. You want to live in the flatland near the river. So, you know, was it a very serious uh, government program to teach Dakotas how to farm? Not so much. Um, but I think that's a story that gets told and retold in various locations. Um, but for those people, I think this in this corner over here, I think the, the, the soil isn't so good. It's pretty sandy, people have told me. But, she was right here. Okay. Right here. Yeah. What about your great-grandfather? He died before she left Norway. Yeah, so she came as a widow. Um, she was 51 years old and came with my grandmother, who was then nine. Yeah, yeah. Did she remarry at all? Nope. Nope. Yes. Any special uh, area in Norway where most of these uh, immigrants came from, or was it pretty much... You know, that's a really interesting question, and it would require a lot of research um, on the part. And, you know, I love work like that by John Jurdy, you know, who tried to do that to trace origins of migration, and I just um, didn't have the resources to be able to do that. Um, people would talk about common communities, even in Minnesota. Um, and you know, again, I'm, I just very briefly mentioned the 1862 war, but um, it was fascinating to me that people who lived 
both on the reservation and right off the reservation. Like I interviewed some families from right over here in Nelson County uh, who had lost relatives in the war. And uh, one guy um, had been shot in the elbow. Uh, he was a kid running away when um, some Dakota warriors had entered his home and killed the rest of his family. But he, and he got shot in the elbow and um, he, he came up to North Dakota and, and started a farm right next to the reservation. So th that's one of the curiosities um, that, that I have about, so what was he thinking? Was he thinking, um, these really aren't my enemies because they're descendants of the former fighters just like I am? Or was the, the land so valuable that it overrode anything else? Um, you know, it's a curious mix. It's really a curious mix. There was a hand in the back. Yes, please. Karen, I was curious. Were you able to study the Dakota Presbyterian and Catholic church records? And if so, were there any Scandinavians mentioned in those records? That's a really interesting question, and I haven't studied them um, and didn't. And I actually um, intentionally avoided the issue of religion in my book. So you will see there is no chapter on the church, per se. I decided it was one of those thornier um, ethical set of issues and required a lot of expertise to un understand and interpret religious practices and that I really didn't have the skill to do that. So I focused on what I knew, which was working on the land, neighborly relations, and I also actually got very caught up in the study of citizenship because citizenship was an issue for both the immigrants and for the native people, and it, it took very different path but, um, for the different groups. Um, but, but I didn't study the church records. It's, it's a book waiting to be written, if anybody <laughs> Thank you so much, okay. Karen.